if you could pan the room. I don't. Know, can you can you pan the room? Oh, there's only four students here this morning. Uh, it, it's you know it's meant to be face to face, right? The Socratic method. I can't I can't teach you if I can't see you. I don't know. This is this is please. So please do come to class. I know it's early in the morning, but look at it this way. It's well. It's two in the afternoon somewhere in the world, right? Just <laughs> in France, right? It's two in the afternoon in France. Had a little espresso, you know. Any uh, last minute questions about the project? No? It's all clear as mud. Seg faults. How many seg faults did you get? Too many? Yeah. Don't, don't worry, I get them too. Right? It's, it's very easy to get a seg fault in MATLAB. Well, not in MATLAB proper, but in C code connected to MATLAB. If you don't get seg faults, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. You're not trying hard enough or something, I don't know. Or you're too good, I don't know, one or the other. Okay, <clears throat> uh, well then today, um, so a couple things, of course, the project is due today uh, at five o'clock. The... Um, Project two I'll be posting later this afternoon. And today I want to get close to wrapping up chapter two. Um, I'm not going to, yeah, I will probably wrap up chapter two. And this is this section on matrix permutation. But first, one last uh Discussion of uh, vector permutation. Yeah, Spencer. Um, for, the, for the second question on the homework, um, like, is it, am I correct? Like, if you use CS underscore sparse to create a sparse matrix, doesn't it automatically? It's already sorting everything. So, like, is there a way to test whether or not it's actually sorting? Because if you try to make it like a matrix, like the way that you typically do it, it, it's already sorted. I think. Doesn't that sort already? Because it uses transpose. Yeah. So it's already okay. sorted if you use that. So you can't use that to test. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question, but let me try to parse the question. The question is: Is this produces a valid MATLAB matrix with sorted row indices yeah. in each column? Yes. And so does that function. Yes. Yeah. And you're mimicking the functionality of both of those two different functions yeah, with a I different mean, method. How do you test and then how do you test it? That's why I gave you Spock. Oh, yeah, I, I, I know I can test it around Spock, but it doesn't like like Spock will tell you if the row indices are out of order. Oh, it will. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, know. it checks for that. I didn't oh yeah, that. it checks for all kinds of things. Okay, that's cool. So I yeah. I just test to make sure it was like valid of like the right data. Everything. I don't. Know. Okay, so yeah, if it comes out with it comes that out would one, be illogical. That means you're right, or if it comes out like an answer of one, that yeah. means it passes. If you get an error message, then it's wrong. But if you get a one, that means true. It means it's okay. If it's a z it returns a zero or. A All right. So actually, no, my question is like, how do I put in a matrix that's not in the right order? Oh, and that I get it to run, and then I can run my code to, to fix it, and then runs. Oh well, no, you can't. can't. You can't do that. But you, what you what I did suggest is is this following test. So you extract. A, you do this in just pure MATLAB, right? Okay. So, of course, you're writing your own find. That's another story. Yeah. So this decomposes, this pulls out the components of a sparse matrix. Okay. And so what I suggested is you do uh, nz equals uh, length of x. You do, you get yourself a random permutation. So you randomly jumble your inputs. Uh, wait, that's not right. I tried to use something like that, but it didn't work. Yeah, ran perm nz. What? Okay, never mind. I tried to use the permutation range, but that's still in the right order. Ran perm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then you do i equals i of p, j equals j. I think I mentioned this in one of the earlier classes. X, does it ring a bell? So you randomly jumble up your triplets. Okay. Okay. Now your triplets are out of order, but any now if you do a equals sparse of i, j, x, m, n, or maybe c, it'll recreate the matrix. So this pulls apart a sparse matrix and puts it back together again. 
Okay. And so, of course, you're writing your own version of this code, and you're writing your own version of this code. So this get, this should work, and if it doesn't, something went wrong. Well, yeah, you're you're writing a code that does this. It takes the triplet form and puts it into a compressed sparse column form. It, I said in the project description it should mimic the function of the sparse command. Yeah, yeah. So you're not supposed to. It's not like what is. It's not like. So is the name of the function sort? Uh, well, you can call it whatever you want. I can call it call it, you know, call it funky. I don't care oh, what you call it. This is what it does, huh? You're not supposed to like input a sparse matrix and as the input. No, it's triplet form. It's unsorted. See, I I, I thought you because it because if you read the the one in the book. Well, I, I modified Yeah, it. I didn't realize that you're supposed to change the input. No, you're not changing the input. Well, you're not the changing input, any. The questions in the book are like the input is a matrix. So I didn't realize that. You, I guess I I I I I, uh, I'm, I, 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 I started with with this logarithmic time sort problem in the book, but then I changed the problem in the project description. I, I'm not saying just do 2.8. No, I know. I I. The, Okay, so I mean, I saw that it should work like that, but I didn't realize it was supposed to take that as an input. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what that's what the project description says. It should act just like this. Oh yeah, I know. See, I didn't realize act like that was like. That's the spec. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right. So okay, but I mean, that's not that to fix. Okay. So when we take c minus a, we should get an O zero spark matrix. I'm sorry. So when we take c minus a. Yeah, you could uh, well yeah c minus a will give you an all zero sparse matrix. Uh, for example, um, the other thing, because you're not worrying about duplicates, I, I told you that explicitly, because um, this will produce, there's no duplicate entries here. There will be no duplicate entries on the input matrix A, and so there's no duplicate triplets. If there were duplicates and you sum them up, which you're not doing, it would be possible to get small error, small differences hidden here, because if you add two numbers, I mean, no, addition is not associative and commutative. In floating point arithmetic. I mean, in CS5, do we need to check the input, whether it's a spark matrix or not? Or we assume that it's always a spark matrix? Where? This, the function you're writing here? Yeah. Uh, the question is do you need uh, extensive error checking like G? Is it a sparse matrix? It is. Um, th there, if, if, you really, if you really did it right, yeah, but there's a lot of error checking. Um, that could be done, that ought to be done on a, in a robust code, but you don't need to do all that if you don't want to. Just get it to work. And we won't, we won't toss it. I won't give you a string and say, oh, I expect a sparse matrix. I mean, I figure you could know, I figure you guys know how to do that, right? Okay, this is, I'm trying to stick to the core algorithms. So we're only at the research prototype level, if you will. If you're doing this for real, yeah, you should check it. And my code does. My code will complain. Like if you pass C sparse, CS sparse here, and it'll say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. It'll, it'll catch all kinds of errors. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you looking primarily at does it work or not? Or yeah. Functionality. Well, the, for grading, the question is, am I looking for whether it works or not? And the answer is yes. And it's mainly that it's not like inside what you're doing. Oh, inside what you're doing does matter a great deal. Yes. If you if you do this, I will puke. If you take that much time, I will actually shred your code to bits, okay? I'm sorry? Memory leaks. Memory leaks, I'm a little less worried about. MATLAB, I mean, uh, in fact, MATLAB, if you look carefully at the code, what's happening, you're not actually calling malloc, you're calling MX malloc. MX malloc is, very, is much more sophisticated. What it does, it says that when your MEX function returns, if you've MX malloc an object, that you haven't freed, MATLAB will free it for you. So there's no leak. So yeah, a memory a memory leak, I'm, I'm not, I mean, 
Yes, if this were real code, you would get rid of the memory leaks. Um, but, um, and I'll look at that and I'll kind of cringe. I'll think, oh, there's you get a memory leak there, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I won't grade you down for it. I'll cringe, but I won't. But if you do this, I will slaughter you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? Because this is, this is not a sparse matrix algorithm. You're supposed to do n log, or k log k. All right, where k is the number of non-zeros. Which, by the way, is, is what um, the sparse function in MATLAB is based upon. It does a logarithmic time sort on the inside. My code doesn't. My code is different. It does a bucket sort. But it has that extra time complexity of m in there, which is no big deal, right? Well, it is in some certain cases. I broke the, they, they, tried to, they tried to incorporate my version of sparse, not from the book, but from another package I have. Um, so I wrote it for them. But they didn't tell me about this bioinformatics toolbox. And I put, they put in my code and it promptly broke their toolbox. Because M is a billion or a 10 billion or whatever. And they don't have the, you don't have the space of the time or the memory to store M. The K was, you know, 100. Okay, so that's a huge difference. Of course, the, the, the proper solution then would be to choose the algorithm based on the input. Is M enormous compared to K? Whoa, okay, let's use a logarithmic, you know, a, a, a log log, a, you know, N log N time algorithm. And if number of non-zeros is larger than M, well, we'll then use the bucket sort. Or the bucket sort requires workspace. If you attempt to allocate workspace and you fail, oh, do an in-place sort. See, I mean, there's all kinds of things like that that could be done that aren't done. But my code, if you give it, a, if you give my sparse code the construction of a sparse matrix, if you give it a typical sparse matrix, like coming from a finite element problem, that, which you, you don't do finite elements, but you know, you, you've got some physics or engineering problem and you're wanting to solve AX equals B and uh, you have to sum up all these duplicate entries because these, these it's like a sum of cliques. The finite element matrix is like a sum of cliques. Think of the graph, think of a graph of, of no edges and a bunch of nodes and just sort of randomly put cliques down upon it. And these cliques are gonna overlap. Where they overlap, you have to sum the edge weights. Okay, that's a finite element problem. So there's duplicates that must be summed. That's why if there, we see duplicates, we sum them up because that's a typical thing that people want to do. And my sparse code, because it's not, this, it doesn't have that extra log factor there, is a factor of 10 times better, faster than the one in MATLAB for finite element mat matrices. But for the bioinformatics toolbox, I'm a billion times slower. So they... I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, in your code, like, you have a sparse matrix A, and you want to set it A, P, the, the, the array P. Yeah. Yeah, usually you have an extra vari uh, variable, like A, P, and you assign A, P equals A, and then arrow P. What is it for? Ah, why do I do this? Why, and, or I do this. Yeah. Because my editor wanted me to. I kid you not. My, the, the editor of the book series, the question is why do I keep doing this in my code? It's like, can't I just use this and not rename it as this? Yeah, I did that at first. But the, you got all these funny little arrow symbols throughout the code. And my editor, New MATLAB, the editor of the book series, knows MATLAB very well in mm -hmm. Fortran, but not C. So he's looking at this arrow thing, and what is that? Okay, but if he sees, oh, AX of square bracket of, you know, five or something, that he can understand quite easily, right? It looks like parentheses, brackets, square brackets, no big deal. That's easily understood. But you stick this extra little funny thing in there, He's wondering what that means. It was just harder for him to read. So, so I said, okay, sure, sure. So I do this. So 
Does this help in display, not help in like, speed up? No, it doesn't speed things up, really. Uh, well, possibly, but I would not have put it in there. But the editor said, ah, I, like, I don't like this. I like this instead. Oh, okay, fine. I didn't fight him on it. There are cases where copying into temporaries does save you time. I don't think that's one of them. It might be, but I don't think it is. But yeah, it, it is a style. It's only a stylistic thing. It does actually cause a little bit of problems because um, what happens, there are a few cases you've seen where I've had to reallocate the matrix to make it bigger, more non-zeros. In doing so, I look at, I grab the struct and I, you know, resize these arrays and fix the pointers accordingly and fix the matrix and add more entries. Well, these pointers have changed, so these get updated by the spreealloc function, but the CS spreealloc function can't update these because these only exist in the caller. So every time after I potentially do a spreealloc, I've got to reacquire the pointers. You see, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can use this if you like, sure. Sure, 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 sure. No problem. Yeah. You know, it's just a stylistic thing. And I, uh, I, I didn't mind the change because I'm, I'm more used to reading this anyway myself. I kind of prefer this because um, I tend to have longer codes and you're reusing these things over and over and over again, and it's just two less characters to type, you know, and, and two less syntactical things to parse when you're looking at, you know, a thousand lines of code, and you see these arrows all over the place, and you wonder, are they dereferencing new things, or are they, you know, and it's just sort of syntactically simpler to see these throughout your code instead of these. But you know these codes are ten lines long each, you know, or twenty or thirty. Or so this is fine. This is stylistic. It's a good question, actually. It, it, it was, there's an answer for that, you know, that, you know, it's 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 uh, my editor wanted it that way. <laughs> it's an interesting answer, interesting question. Anyway, any other questions about the project? Okay. Yeah, so the, in terms of the projects, what I care about are the algorithms and the time complexity, space complexity. Details like memory checks, I'll get your, you have a question? Uh, de detail like, you know, memory leaks. Uh, oh, here's another one that you don't need to check because you can't. You allocate some memory. You notice in my codes, I'm very worried about what happens if that memory allocation fails, right? do all sorts of things to avoid that, you know, to, to clean up and to check and all that. Well, if you're only testing in MATLAB, you will never be able to test that code. Because what happens in MATLAB, the mxmalloc function that you call, if you call it in a MATLAB x function or the, whatever the MATLAB x function calls, and you try to allocate space that, and it fails, it doesn't return a null pointer. It terminates your mx function entirely and go, kicks you back to MATLAB and says out of memory. Okay, and it frees up all your temporary workspaces for you. Okay, it does all this beautiful stuff for you. That then there's no memory leaks, and you don't have to worry about memory handling. So that means you can't even test your memory handling code. So you can't even write it. It's pointless. The only way to test it is to write standalone C code that doesn't use MX malloc, just use malloc. And if that malloc fails, it gives you a null, and it's your job now to fix it up. But you see, that's what I have. My demo programs, my state. I have in, in, in CSPARS, in the TCOV directory, a complete exhaustive test which exercises every line of code and every memory failure, every potential memory failure. And then asks, are there a leak? You know, is there a leak? It exhaustively checks. Every one of my codes comes with this exhaustive check code. Scaffolding code, and you have to do that in pure C, standalone C. You can't do that in MATLAB. But I'm not asking you to do that, so don't worry about memory leaks. So you just ignore this, like, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could. I mean, I mean, it doesn't have to be testable. I mean, it's not testable. testable. That's the thing. If you allocate workspace, yeah, you should be nice and free it. Okay. It is, a, it is slightly, MATLAB, the documentation does tell you uh, that if you rely on MATLAB to free your temporary workspaces, it'll be a little slower. Because what happens is, I think there's a counter that says, oh, there's zero allocated workspaces left. Or there's five allocated works. Oh, there's five. Let me go look. And it's got to do a lot of work looking to find those five. So it takes some time. So, Devia, you had a question. Instead of writing this uh, .c file in the source, would it be okay to handle this in a next function? So to handle which in the next function? The I'm sorry. Uh, find file. Oh yeah, if you want to do everything in a, in, in a max function by itself for this project, that's fine. Yeah, that not split it into source versus directory versus the max function. You mean? It's of course all has to be in C. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, First, when you okay, to find so CS underscore find, you you're, pass a matrix A. Okay. Before that, you have to allocate a pass matrix. CS find of A. Okay, you're writing this. Yeah, before that, you have to uh, parameter pass to A should be a pass matrix. Right. So that is done using the MATLAB CS underscore. No, you can get this matrix any way you like. I don't care how you get the matrix. There's UF get. Okay, I've suggested that's a good source of matrices. Uh, there's a function called sprand, which generates random sparse matrices. There's many ways of testing your code, but uh, how you get the matrix in MATLAB is just pure MATLAB. You don't have to write C code to generate a sparse matrix. What about the second one? Where uh, you want the row and column next to be jumbled and not in the... Here, mm -hmm. do a jumble it that way. This is the easiest way to do it. Well, they're two separate pieces of a project. They don't, they don't, the two pieces of the project don't have to couple to each other. This is like a separate problem. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, re could, <laughs> could you repeat the question, please? Because I didn't understand it. What's the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, so basically, uh, you create this pass matrix where all the indices are in order in the first place, and then you permit it. In no. Your, uh, wait, wait. You you you're going too fast. Okay. I, you created a matrix. Okay. Now you're talking about the last, second part of the project when you're creating a matrix, a sparse matrix. So then, by definition, a MATLAB sparse matrix has sorted row indices. So. Yeah. And you're trying to test out the function that you wrote. Wh which function? Uh, this Are we talking about the first? Two dot eight. Okay. The modified two dot eight. Okay. You're creating a sparse matrix. Okay. And, and then I'm passing that to my uh, function that I wrote. Which function you wrote? Uh, so let's call it CS uh, quick sort. No, you're not passing a matrix to your sort function. See, that's why I, that's the same thing I thought. That no, yeah. no, you're not. The input to your function in problem two is not a, a, a matrix. It's a list of triplets. Yeah. How do you do that? Is that what you're this is what your project, I say in the project description, this is what your project should do. You should take a list of triplets, sort them, and produce a matrix. The only reason I refer to the sort thing is because, well, like, like I'm just, uh, I should have maybe not even referred to problem 2.8 because it's causing some confusion I didn't expect. But in, in I'm just, I just said in the project description, it's, it's like problem 2.8, Except because it's using Q sort. I know I don't say in the project description I say do this specifically. The but then you could always input something else. No. Well, no, no, no. You, you, your input is not a matrix. Your input is a list of triplets. Yeah, no. So I, like you said, it should act like this. I didn't realize that meant like. That's it, the, that's what it that's does. Where it should be. Like, I, I didn't realize that that was the list of inputs. So that's the same question that she didn't realize. Now, like, I'm pretty sure. How would I even check it? Because 
if you just pass a matrix, it's like every way that you can show to make a sparse matrix is automatically sorted. Well, so yeah, yeah. But this way, obviously, yeah, now you can check it. That's what my question was. It's the same thing. Um, uh. Well, it was not meant to be confusing. I didn't mean to confuse you. I'm sorry. I mean, if you wrote um, it that way, it should be like incredibly easy to fix it. Um. Your function should act like this in MATLAB. Right. Yeah. That's pretty clear. I just didn't realize it meant like it should take that as the command. There's like the the arguments. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, yeah, I can see how you got confused. Uh, um, if uh, Yeah, it's because it's now it's it's a, it's a if. Oh, let's see. I tell you what. Why don't we do this? Um, do, do you understand what I'm supposed to do now? And for those of you on tape, I'm sorry if you're not here. You know what can I? I can't talk to you, right? So. <laughs> so listen to the tape. I don't know. You're responsible for what happens in class, right? I mean, when I say things in class, I expect you all to know, right away. Uh, but what I could do here, and I'll post an announcement um, as well. But if uh, if you were confused by this, um, I mean, I could give you some more time to to fix it. If if and I apologize for the confusion. Um, so Monday would that work? I mean, I don't think. I mean, can you just? I mean, all you have to do is instead of. Like if you pass the matrix, you're already going to take it. You're already split it apart. Yeah, it's not much of a change, but if you've got a full day today, you don't have time to fix it by five o'clock. You know, so I, I, I don't want to. I mean, if you've written it one way and you, then you got to, you've got to change it to taking triplets on inputs. You've got to use a couple get ints in the max function instead of the get sparse, and you got to do. You know, yeah. it's some change if you've done it the one way. Um, I uh, apologize for the confusion. I did try to. I did. I did. I did give this example. So this is what your function is doing. I thought I said that in, when I explained it in class. But anyway, uh, so I did try to make that clear. I probably shouldn't have referred to problem 2.8 at all. I think that's the source of the confusion, and that's my fault. I'm sorry. I should have. I just should have said, look, do this, and just wrote it from scratch rather than try to talk about using quicksort. Oh yeah, like 2.8 uses quicksort. Anyway, so that's my fault. That's not clear. I'll be more clear next time. I'm sorry. I should have been more clear. Yeah. Do we need to document what we did? Uh, I I did say yes in uh, uh, in where I think I mentioned this in class um, or an announcement. Uh, it, it tell me you know at least tell me you know what codes you added. You know, give me a short little paragraph or so, tell me what codes you added. Um, tell me if it failed. Don't give me code that I have to figure out is broken. Okay, because then I'll try hard to figure out, well, oh, is it broken because I'm breaking it because I'm using Linux and you use Windows and there's some memory leak that causes Linux to seg fault but not Windows to seg fault or something like that. But if you know your code doesn't work, you can save us a lot of time and headache by saying, well, I know this code doesn't work, but here's my attempt. Okay? So please tell me if it's broken. Because if I find a seg fault, I'll wonder, well, gee, you didn't realize you had a seg fault. Maybe you didn't realize you had a seg fault. Because you know, maybe I test on Linux and you work. If, so if yours worked on Windows, that means a TA could, and we find a seg fault in Linux, because that's where, where we're tested, then, OK, well, at least if you say, hey, it does work, well, then we'll go test it on Windows. Oh, yeah, yeah, it works there. There must be some weird thing about the memory leak or something that's causing a failure, and we'll just say fine. But that'll give us a hint as to say, is to know what to do. Otherwise, if, if it just doesn't work at all, we'll just spend all that time spinning our wheels 
testing it, trying to get the thing to figure out why the thing doesn't work when in fact you know full well it doesn't work. And then at that point, we can just grade the pseudo as, as a pseudocode, right? We can't run the thing, but we at least can look at your ideas uh, and grade the ideas. Okay, so do tell us if it doesn't work. <laughs> Basic things like that. Okay. I will go ahead and post project two uh, today. So if you finished it, you can get started on project two. But if you're confused about this, um, um, you'll have some time hopefully over the weekend to fix it. And stop by. I'm available today. Uh, I've got a, me a meeting this afternoon, but um, I'll be available most of today. So. Any other questions? No. Do I see the look of, I don't see the look of panic in your eyes, do I? No. Okay. All right. Um, well, with that permutation of project one, <laughs> back to permutation. Mm, I hate toolbars that disappear on you. That is so annoying. Well, but I don't like Windows anyway, so who am I to complain? Okay, so uh, one last uh, thing about permutation vectors. So here's, uh, here's how to compute the inverse of a permutation vector. Remember, and I think this is personal, uh, but then I, I'm dyslexic, so maybe this is not how you like to think of things, but I like to think of the permutation vector as p of k equals i, okay, where k is referring to the new and i is the old. So it's p of, in other words, p of new equals old is a permutation vector. And p inverse of old is new. So if I have this and I want this, or vice versa actually, because it goes both ways, then I have to do the following. For say this thing I can look up using new. So if I say for new equals zero to n minus one, I have new, I can get the old, old equals p of new. And then I can say p inverse of old equals new. So there's the code to convert a permutation vector into an inverse permutation vector, and that's what this does. Um, and what's a few other curious things about this code, actually, of course, a null permutation vector is, is implicitly identity. So this function returns null for null, but also turns null if it runs out of workspace. So that's a bit of a lie. It's like this permutation is null. Does it mean a failure? Does it mean, so I'm left to the caller to figure out the fact that, hey, I passed you a permutation vector that's not null, and null is not the inverse. So you, you could have to check your own um, a little more carefully. But anyway, be that as it may. So this is it right here. I just lumped this together, you know, take this very temporary variable out and just put this in here, and you get p inv of p of k equals k. So this is rather compact to understand, right? But if you see, if you think of it this way, and in fact, when I write this kind of code, I don't write it this way right away. I write it out on pencil, well, or just on, I write it in code, I write it this way first, and then I get rid of the temporary variable if I, want, if I wish to, or, if I, or I leave it there just for illustration so I know what I'm doing. Okay, because that's harder to understand than this is. Of course, that's why I'm lecturing, so you can understand things. So uh, let me show you some examples now of where we want to uh, use permutations and permutation inverses, and that's matrix permutation. Okay, and um, 
So in in uh, you can do this as matrix matrix multiply C equals P A Q where P capital P and capital Q is the capital are meant to be matrices or you can in MATLAB notation say this A P Q where actually in MATLAB this can be anything you like these vectors right I showed you that example this this does not have to be a permutation vector of one through n it can be Anything, you know, it can be, it can have duplicates in it. It's like, give me a, it can be a submatrix, it can be a permuted submatrix, okay. My code doesn't handle all those different possibilities. Um, what we're going to ask is, well, how, do, how would I do a complete permutation of the matrix? So there's no, uh, so I'm not going to do this. Okay, that would be the MATLAB notation for, give me, give me, Two copies of the entries in the entry, the one entry in A1, comma 2. Right? That would give me row 1 twice. Gives me a vector of this dimension with the, with the entry copied into those two places. All right? I'm not going to. You try this in MATLAB, it'll work just fine, but. I'm not going to handle that. I'm not, this is not the purpose of this, of this function. I'm, I'm assuming for the moment that I'm going to just permute a matrix using permutation vectors. So to do this, uh, the columns are easy. Actually, the columns are easy whether you use an inverse permutation vector or permutation vector. Think about it this way. See, the, 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 how do you find a column? Well, column J is in AP of j to ap of j plus 1 minus 1 in this position in ai and ax. Okay, so all I'm going to know is where that column is. So let's suppose I want to walk through, forget for the moment the row permutation. Let's suppose I just want to permute the columns. I can actually either use a permutation vector or an inverse permutation vector just fine. What if I have a permutation vector? Okay, the permutation vector I have to index for the new space. So I just say for new equals 0 to n minus 1, but I can't use this to index into this matrix because this does not match this. Right? This is AP, this J is old. Because old in the sense it's referring to the unpermuted matrix, right? So I can't say, well, give me column new. Well, that doesn't exist. So what column do I need? I need the old one. So then I look it up in the permutation vector. Old equals P of new. And then I can look at column old in A. And put it in a new matrix, say, as new. So I have the new and the old both. Okay. And I can do it as I wish if I'm creating a new matrix, if I'm whatever. Okay, I have both the old and the new, which is what I would need normally. This is what I call an example of viewing a, viewing a matrix through a lens of a permutation. Excuse me, is that Q of new that you're looking at a matrix? Q, where's Q? I don't have a Q here. Where, where's it? Uh, you're permutating columns, right? I'm just looking at column permutations, yes. So as your input, you should have Q. Oh, I called it P, I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I should call it P, Q here, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. That's more clear. Yeah, I'm only looking at the column permutation. Q, I'll call it Q now, yeah. Thanks. Um, and so... Uh, Anyway, this is what I call viewing a matrix through the lens of a permutation. Uh, suppose I really want to operate on, the ma on this matrix, AQ. And well, I want to traverse its columns in some order, okay? Depending on the order I want to traverse them in, that does matter as to whether I use the inverse permutation or the permutation. But this will visit the columns in the new permuted order, won't it? Because it'll go through the new columns. So this, 
this loop will visit the first column of the matrix AQ, and then the second column of the matrix AQ, and then the third, and then the fourth. That's the new space. But some algorithms don't care which order they visit the matrix. I mean, maybe I'm doing a matrix vector multiply with, I want to do this, say. Well, I could visit, I could do this in any order because uh, addition is more or less associative and commutative and all that, except with round off error, it's not, but we ignore that fact. So um, maybe I don't have Q, maybe I have Q inverse instead. Well, if I have Q inverse instead of Q, I can still do this. I can say for old equals zero to N minus one, then I just say new equals Q inverse of old and now ditto. I do the I, I look at the old column and I put I view it as the new column. Okay, so an uh, when you're looking at columns, it's quite easy to use either the the permutation vector Q or its inverse Q inverse. It does affect the order in which you're going to traverse the matrix, but you can view this matrix, you can extract entries out of this matrix without making a copy of it. You can extract entries out of the permuted matrix without making a copy of the permuted matrix using these either Q or Q inverse. It does, which you use will affect the order in which you visit the columns of this permuted matrix, but if you don't care, you can use either one. If you do care, you have to use one versus the other. This will, this will visit them in the order of the, which they appear in A. This, this will visit the columns in the order in which they appear in A times Q, the permuted matrix. Take your pick. So columns are easy to do one versus the other. Uh, row indices are a little trickier, okay? Because we can't just say, oh, go for each row, 0, 10, minus 1, and do something with that row, because you can't, you can't take this data structure and say, give me the ith row, give me the, you know, give me the 27th row, please. You, we can't do that. Well, you could, but it'd be pathetic. Okay. So what we we have to there? Okay. If if I want to, uh, if I'm at a column here, let's let's imagine we're right here, and I'm looking down a column of a matrix, I extract a row index. What is that row index? Is it old or new? It's old, right. And so if I want to recast it into the space of new, okay, then what do I need? If I have something that's old and I want to make it new, what do I need? The, 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 a permutation vector or it's, or it's inverse? It's inverse, exactly, because look, it's like a lookup table. I have a function, I give it the old and I get out the new. So I need the inverse row permutation. The column permutation you can use either one, it does affect the order in which you visit the entries, the columns. The row permutation, on the other hand, if you want to traverse the old matrix here and view it through a lens and get out the new matrix row index, then I would need to say I, I new, if you will, equals P of I old, where I old is, is looked up, you look up from the AI array. You see that? So that's what this function does. It, it do, doesn't just traverse the matrix, it's actually constructing a whole new matrix. Okay, so here's, here's the requisite you know, check to make sure I'm going to compress column major. Here's here's my edit editorial line of line that says get rid of all the funny arrows. <laughs> it's funny nobody's ever asked me that question, so I've never had this to give a little. But it's a funny history. Of this is why those little why this statement is here. It has a fun little funny little history to it. Um, I. Spallic a matrix here of size m by n. This is the number of non-zeros in the new matrix. A p of n, remember, is the number of non-zeros in the matrix. Um, this tells me whether I need to, to also permute the numerical values, and this tells me it's a compressed column, not a triplet matrix. I've checked the failure, if failure, and then I get out the c matrix. I'm constructing c from a. 
You notice as input, I have the row permutation P inverse, but the column permutation Q. I could have asked for Q inverse. There is, by the way, a typo. It's a trivial typo in page 150 or so, 151 in the book, where I have the list of all the prototypes of these functions, and I call this P, not P inverse. Okay, your version, your addition, I'm not, the printing may have, I think I may have fixed it in the printing. You may not have that error. It's correct here, it's correct on this page of the book, and it's incorrect. If, you, if it is incorrect, on page like 151 it's in, or 152, it's incorrect there. So then um, what has to happen here? Well, I'm, K I, uh, is the new column. Okay, so I'm using, using this outline over here. So K is new. K is the new column. So I'm going to walk through the new columns, and uh, which is kind of handy because what that means is that I can easily construct the column pointers on the fly. So NZ starts out to be zero, and I'm just going to do my own cumulative sum as I walk through and build this matrix. Because, of course, as I permute this matrix, the column pointers of the matrix are going to be completely different than the column pointers of the old one. The column counts, the number of non-zeros in each column will be a permutation, but the, then the result of the column pointers is a cumulative sum of that vector. So it's going to be completely different. So I just compute it from scratch right here. And uh, so I get out J is the uh, J is the old J equals Q of K here. This is the old column J and the new column K. And you notice I do this ternary operator check for Q. If Q is the null vector, then there is no Q. And then I walk through the entries of the old column J and I copy over the numerical value, but then I copy over the row index and I pass it through PINV, P inverse. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this statement right here. I get the new row index out from the old one through, whoops. Ah. See, this is, this is easy to mis make this mistake. Look what I just did. Do you see that? That's wrong. I said it was the inverse permutation, didn't I? You said it, didn't I? Didn't you, right? Go rewind the tape, quick. I wrote it down wrong. Ah. Huh? I new equals P inverse of I old. I'm sorry? You got it reversed, yeah, so did I. <laughs> it's very easy. Oh, this gets, it gets really nasty. Imagine if you have per permutations composed upon each other and submatrices, permuted submatrices. Imagine, just imagine how God, you got, you got multiple, I've had places where I've had like three or four different permutation spaces. Oldest and then old, older and then old and then new and then newest and then I gotta go bing, 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 bing and I have some cases inverses and not inverses and I gotta go and my brain explodes. So um, uh, anyway, so we extract out the entry, copy it over, change the row index to the new one, and then uh, don't forget this last little statement, CP of n equals nz, right? Got to terminate, and that's a very common error. You can't see it from down there, but it's a very common error to, to forget to terminate the very end of the column pointers. I have a question. Yeah. For the row computation, why don't we transfer the matrix and do the uh, column for the row permutation, why don't we transpose the matrix and then permute the columns? Yeah. Uh, we can, but then I can... Faster or... Transpose, I mean, well, I mean, I didn't need to do the transpose here. And I'm creating the new matrix right away. from the old one just in one copy. So this is less memory. And computing an inverse, if I don't have P inverse and I need it, it's linear time and linear space, more importantly, actually. So making a uh, inverse permutation, if you don't have P inverse, it's easy to compute. Um, so that's a matrix permutation. 
and I'm, I've got probably 30 seconds left. I don't have time to talk about the last discussion, whoops, which is symmetric permutation, which takes two pages because it's here now I'm going to assume that I have a matrix that's symmetric. And I'll just set up the problem. Basically, I'm, I'm permuting it symmetrically, P A, P transpose. And in C sparse with symmetric matrices, I assume that only the upper triangular part is stored, is of relevance. I don't have a data structure that tells you, oh, or a, fl a flag that says, oh, this is a symmetric matrix, only look at the upper triangular part. It's only how you use it. Uh, but all the mates, all the methods in the in the package that operate on symmetric matrices implicitly assume that oh you're working on a symmetric matrix I'm going to ignore anything down below here because I'll assume that the bottom part is the transpose of the top part. MATLAB is different. MATLAB has both copies present. Uh, my code I assume I only look at the top part. No. Well, MATLAB does this in some cases too. When you do, say, a Cholesky factorization on the symmetric matrix, it doesn't check if it's symmetric. It just looks at the top part. Anyway, so we'll pick up there. How do you then take a matrix in this form and permute it? Because weird things happen. A mat an entry that's in the top may go into the bottom, and you've got to move it back up to the top again. It's, it's really weird, and I'll talk about that next class on Monday.